So I was, I was told a couple weeks ago uh, by my wife that she was so distracted by my fidgeting on the stool that she could hardly hear a word I was saying. She had to close her eyes and look away at one point because she said, Brent, you were just fidgeting. You, sit still. And then if you were here last week, you'll remember JD said, I love your pastor, but I don't like his stool. And so he moved it back there. Um, but the other thing he said was, boy, that pastor of yours, he is very fidgety. He's always moving. Look, I'm unmedicated. That's no surprise to most of you. Um, but this word wakes me up. What Jesus is doing in me is waking me up. And as I wake up, I'm recognizing, you know that there's that, um, in, the, in the Asian culture, there's this thing called the yin and the yang, right? And the intent is to show the opposites, light and dark, high, low, whatever it might be. I'm, I'm being generous with my own perspective on that. Um, here's what I'm learning, though. Uh, when I was sleeping, it was harder for me to tell that you were sleeping, too. When I was asleep, it was hard for me to notice that you were asleep. When I was sleepwalking through my own faith, it made it harder to identify that you too were sleepwalking because our faith started to look alike. And one of the things that I'm learning is that uh, I wasn't called to, um, to settle in to the faith perspectives of the watching world. I was, I was sent to be a light in dark places. I was sent to be a shepherd of lost sheep. I was sent to join Jesus in his mission to rescue those who were lost. To seek and to save the lost is the language he used. And what I'm finding is Jesus is waking me up and we could spend some time with me telling you why this is happening and how this is happening and what a difference that's making in me, but we don't really have time because I need to get us into the word of God and I can tell you that this is part of what's waking me up. And as I'm waking up, I'm noticing that I am leading a church that has fallen asleep uh, I, I have recognized that I'm leading a church that has allowed showing up on Sunday morning uh, in some ways to be enough. I'm noticing that, that what, um, what I want for you, uh, this life that Jesus gives us, I want it more for you than you want it for yourself. And I'm carrying a real burden. I'm not attempting to be judgmental here whatsoever. I'm not um, pretending that I know your soul, that I know your daily practice of following Jesus. I, um, all I know is that the Bible says that um, good trees bear good fruit. All I know is that, that uh, the Bible says it pretty clearly that what's in you will come out of you. And, and I wanna be a leader. I wanna be a pastor who uh, encourages you to, let what is going on inside of you out. And, um, and that's why I keep doing my work. And some of you, um, some of us, aren't gonna like the pastor who's awake because I'm gonna say things that you haven't heard me say before. You might even see me doing things I, you haven't seen me do before. You might hear a deeper bit of conviction in my voice than you've heard before. Might be fewer funny stories and more gathering around the word of God and the word alone. Uh, some of you aren't gonna be happy with that. And some of you, I'm just predicting, some of you will find another church where the pastor's more entertaining than I am. But I just can't help myself. And I didn't get into this for this. I didn't get into this to have a, a stage with a bunch of people showing up and a lot of money in the bank and a lot of things on the calendar. That's not why I did this. I got into this because I want you to know Jesus. I want you to know Jesus. I want you to believe that there's nothing I can give you that will match, even come close to what Jesus can give you. And that's the only reason we're gathering is for me to, to show you what Jesus is doing in me and to make it so appealing that you would want him to do it for you. And so we're going through the book of John. The Gospel of John is gonna introduce us to Jesus in some ways that maybe the other Gospels don't, but they do help to tell the broader story. We're gonna dig in. The encouragement is that you'll be reading your Bible every single day, not, not reading a devotional, not looking for um, what I would call maybe haphazard um, daily beginnings, but a beginning in a consistent reading of the Gospel of John, just following the story along. 
looking for Jesus in the pages, experiencing him and his pleasure over you as you meet with him. That's what we're gonna try to do. And we're gonna do this basically until Easter. We're gonna be in the Gospel of John basically from now to Easter. Uh, there'll be a couple times when we back out of it uh, at Advent. We're gonna give special focus to the four weeks that we prepare for Christmas, the birth of Jesus, incarnation of, of God in the person of Jesus. And then there'll be another four weeks where we spend on stewardship. And, and those are the two things that the Woodlands Method as a whole are doing. We're doing these things together. But apart from that, uh, we're just gonna be in the Gospel of John. And um, I'm not gonna become a professor because I'm not one. I'm gonna be a dude. I'm gonna be Brent, your friend, your pastor, your neighbor. And uh, so you can count on that at least. But I'm gonna be real, and some of you have come to love or not that. So here's where we are um, we're in John chapter two. And in John chapter two, we have some very familiar stuff happening. It's stuff that you've heard before, but I want you to hear it again, like freshly. And I want you to, just in honor of the word of God that's being spoken, I want you to, to stand up where you are and we're gonna listen to this word that I wanna read to you. I want you to have ears to hear. And as your ears are hearing, I want your eyes to see what's going on in this story. Maybe even put yourself in the middle of it. They put yourself in the middle of it. If you're a learner who learns by reading, you're welcome to read along with me. If you're a learner who is a visual learner, then close your eyes and just let me tell you where we are here. In John chapter two, we have this. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee, and Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also invite, been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. By the way, if you're reading along, there's a decent chance that what's in your book, it's an open source Bible. We could not use the NIV in that without getting sued. So some of the words may look a little different. Some of you read King James, the words are a little different, but the story's all the same. Continuing in verse six. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each one holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they did. They filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. So they did it. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He didn't realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water, they knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and he said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink, but you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. This is the word of God for you, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated one of the things I love about this first story is that it takes two things that we know about, one thing that we know about pretty well to teach us about the thing we don't know very well. Some of us know a lot more about wine than we know Jesus, and some of us know a lot more about Jesus than we know wine. But in this case, you get to learn about both side by side. So before we get too far into this wine miracle, this narrative of Jesus doing the miraculous, his first of, of many signs, uh, let's see if we can remember where we were this past week. So last week, you know, I haven't preached in two weeks, so some of y'all are going, oh boy, here we go. The clock is no longer a part of this. He's just gonna go. I'm not, I'll be faithful, as faithful as I've ever been. So John 1, do you remember how John 1 began, what JD kind of kicked us off with this past Sunday? You remember this? In the beginning was the Word. It's the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was was God. It was there in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made. In him was life. And that life was the light of all humanity. The light came into the darkness and the darkness could not overcome it. This is how the whole gospel begins. And here we have more light, more light to wake us up. 
So JD also taught us something else, and I'm wondering if we remember. It's gonna be very important that you remember these things week to week. Remember, he told you there's five R's on our hand. Remember? Do you all remember the first one? So we just did. We read the word. Read the word. Remember, he said, read it out loud so that you can hear it and, and then see it. Read it, right? Remember what the next thing he said? Ruminate, right? He talked about cows, which was really yucky, by the way. I was not born on a farm or grown up on a farm, so that was not all that appealing to me. He talked a little bit about like the dog with a bone. That, that was a little bit easier. I do have a dog. But the idea of ruminating was don't just read it to be able to say you read it and move on. The idea is to read it and then reread it and then reread it and then let it read you and then read it and then let it read you and then read it. Just hang out with it for as long as you can. And that's why we're giving you little bits to read each day because you've got plenty of time in your day to read and let it read you every single day. You do. I promise you. I have time to even write it down every verse so far. Just write it down. What was the third? Remember? Remember eyes. This is kid's word. Remember eyes. Find a part of it that really stands out to you and commit it to memory. Let it be the first words that you speak when you wake up in the morning. In the beginning was the word, God. Jesus, you were with God. You were God. You were there in the beginning, God. See? And then let it be the last word. Remember eyes. But you've got to have some of it in you that you can return to throughout the day. Do you remember the fourth one? Research. Research. That's what many of us count on the pastor to do. Go spend your week digging into commentaries, right? What do other preachers have to say about that same word? Collect all of, basically be Google for us. Save us the effort, pastor. Tell us what other people are saying about this thing. But that's not what JD called research. He said, research means what? To search again. He just says, read it again. And then the fifth one. This is important. Now, can I be honest with you? I forgot what the fifth one was. So I texted him last night. I said, JD, what was the fifth one again? Was it um, rejuvenate? Was it recap? Was it, and he called me a bad name. And then he said, <laughs> he made fun of me. And then he says, rehearse. And I thought, man, that's the part we all forget. <laughs> There's a whole nother sermon there. It's not, it's not that we forget the word. We forget to do it. <laughs> we forget to rehearse what we just read. We can't do that anymore. When you're sleepwalking, you don't even notice that you're not rehearsing the word of God. But when you wake up, you start noticing so many parts of your life that are not aligning with the word of God. You've begun rehearsing what you saw on the news or on Facebook or your neighbor. You are no longer rehearsing Jesus. Lord's word, that's important. You gotta get it off the page and into us. And so that's what I've done with chapter two. Let me see if any of us, if any of you who have been reading it, if you, if you saw some of the same stuff I saw. So basically, here we are at a wedding. We're at a wedding and the, the wine has run out. Man, if you're the host of that party and the wine runs out. I mean, have you ever been to a wedding where the food and beverage started to run out? Like a wedding you were invited to. Like not... Not a wedding crasher kind of place where you show up because you found out they were gonna have free food and alcohol and you just walked in and pretended you owned the place. But I mean, like, you go to a wedding, you know the people who are hosting the thing. Have you ever found yourself noticing that things are running low and going, oh boy, they're almost out of queso. People are gonna have a, just a riot here. <laughs> queso and Shiner Bach. If you run out of those two things at a, at a re, re, reception, you're in trouble. Sorry, I digress. She's noticing this. She'd been invited to the wedding, and Jesus and the disciples, it says, they were invited too. And, and there were servants there, so the, the people who were throwing this wedding, they, they had some set of means, right? They had servants. And, and the wine runs out, and Mary, who does know Jesus fully at this point, I mean, she knew him in the womb. She thanked God that he was the Messiah coming from her womb. She knew things about him that nobody else had yet to find out about him. So she sees a problem. She had already learned to trust. Jesus can fix it. So she runs to Jesus, her son. She says, hey, son, hey, psst, come here. The wine, it's almost gone. I don't even know if Jesus drank wine. Don't know if he really cared that the wine was running out, but it, it mattered a lot to Mary. Mary, it mattered to her because the hospitality piece was gonna be lost. The wedding was gonna be lost. Nobody ever wants the wedding to be over. 
wanted to keep the party going. And so maybe she's saving her friends some embarrassment. Maybe they're afraid people will start to leave early and the party will end prematurely. No one wants that party to end. And so she says, do something. She knew he was able. He wasn't wanting to do it. That's the problem. He says something to the effect of, uh, mother. In some translations, it's like, mother, why are you bothering me with this? To which she probably would have said, because I know you can do something about it. Do something about it, like a good mother. Other translations say that it reads something more like, mom, is that any of our business? Look, we're not throwing this party. They're throwing the party. Let them worry about it. It's not our problem. And it's in that translation where I think about the way we look at the world and we see the problems in the world. And so often someone comes to us and says, we gotta do something about it. To which we say, it's not my business. It's not my problem. I didn't get them into that. They get themselves out of it. Look, I didn't even know that people were starving over there. Well, now you do. What are you gonna do about it? Right? It's this, this idea that there's something wrong in our world. There's something wrong in parts of the world that we don't even know that there's something wrong. But there are parts of the world that something's wrong, and we know there's something wrong. And it's like we become aware of it, and it's not really our problem. I don't really know why Jesus didn't want to, to do this thing, work this miracle. But when he says the words, it's not yet my time, in some translations, or it's not yet my hour in other translations, probably a better translation. Everywhere else in the Gospel of John, when he says my hour, what he's talking about is when people find out that I'm the man and when people take me to that cross, my time of suffering, my time of crucifixion is my hour. As we go through the Gospel of John, you're gonna find that's the, what, what typically is around that word hour, H-O-U-R, hour. My hour has not yet come. So I found myself wondering, so did Jesus know in his humanness? Did he know that the moment it gets out, the moment word gets out that I can do what I can do, man, it's just gonna fast forward me to that place I don't wanna go. And some of you would say, well, sure, he wanted to go to the cross. Well, he forgot the garden where he said, Jesus, if you could take this cup from me. There was something in Jesus that was not like waking up every morning going, I can't wait for the cross. Was there something about this? He had this idea that if he were to do something right now in this place, it would set things in motion that he could not hold back. I don't know. I'm just, I'm wondering out loud with you as I read the word. But the story continues. And before Mary walks away from Jesus, she says to the servants, hey guys, gals, guys, y'all just do whatever he tells you. It's almost like under her breast, he's going, he knows what he should do right now. So when he tells you what to do, just go do what he says. And then she walks away. Some of us have had parents who did that. You know, you know what to do. And then they work. They turn and walk away. And you're like, oh, accountability, conviction. <laughs> right, there's others in your life who, hey, you know what you're supposed to do here. Just do what he says to do. Yeah. Oh, you can't get away from it anymore. So the story continues. The story continues. He tells the servants to go and fill the water jars. Now these jugs, 20 to 30 gallons each, we don't know if they were different size, like some were 20s, some were 25s, and some were 30s. Don't know, they were handmade, so they probably weren't replicas, exactly the same. But that's not really what matters. What matters is that he said, go fill those things to the brim. So they go and they fill these things to the brim. These servants had filled these things before to the brim because they were made for washing, and there was always something to wash, always cleansing necessary. So he says, go fill them. And then after they had filled them, the Bible says that Jesus said, Give, take a cup from those, take it over to the master of ceremonies. And so they do. They take a cup of it over to the ceremonies. And here's what I'm wondering. The guy who got stuck carrying it to the master of ceremonies. Like, hey, so uh, word is you're running out of wine. Hey, I got some more. What? Where'd you get it? Uh, uh, don't worry about that. Here, it's in this cup. And you can see them. I don't know if it was a glass cup. They probably weren't doing a lot with glass those days. It's probably more pottery. So you look into it. I don't know if you could tell if it was just dirty foot water or if it was <laughs> wine. I don't know. I don't know. Floaters. I don't know what's in there. But 
one of the servants had to carry that. They carried it over here. <laughs> Can you just see? Here, try it. <laughs> Have you tried it? No. <laughs> it's for you. And I don't know, again, y'all don't, some of you don't drink wine, but here's let me tell you about wine. You don't just chug it. You don't chug wine. Some of you might. You got a problem and we need to talk about it. <laughs> but for most of us who are sophisticated wine drinkers, you pour it into the cup and you give it a good sniff. Could you imagine this guy taking a cup of dirty water to this guy and going, sniff that? <laughs> and it wasn't like stank foot smell. It was, hmm. Could you see the servant going, what in the, what are you doing? <laughs> Boy, this is good. Where did you get this? Over there. And then the master of ceremonies runs to the groom and says, bro, whoa, where have you been hiding this? Oh, it's vintage. No, 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 we ran out of the stuff you told me to serve. This came from somewhere, we don't know where it came from, but it's tasted. On the tongue, back of the tongue, roof of the mouth. Yeah, you know, I do that. It's the best ever. Now, don't get caught up in that part. Because there's more to the story. The master tastes it, says it's good, gives it to the groom who says it's good. And then I can just picture Mary looking across the room at Jesus. <laughs> just winking. Good job, boy. And then he turns to the servants and they're like, you see the servants running off to taste their own and, <laughs> and the miracle's done. Here's the thing. There's that line. Man, I have so much more I want to say. We're going to run out of time. I can already tell. So let me think about what I want to tell you. There was a line in here that jumped at me. It was verse five. Uh, chapter two, verse five, where Mary says to the servants, do whatever he tells you. That was sort of convicting for me this week. Of the whole story, Mary says to the servants, hey, do whatever Jesus says. Just do what he says. Do what he tells you. And I started to wonder if I would show up today to a room full of people who, who are kind of in a, one of two camps. Uh, of a camp who says, man, I haven't asked that question in a long time. Jesus, what do you want me to do? Like, I want you to bless what I'm doing. I want you to show me favor. I want you to heal the people that I want healed. I want your, you to help my team win and not that team win. I want you to do what I want. But I started to wonder, I wonder how many of us have I said, Jesus, what do you want? What do you want me to do? What do you want for me? What do you want from me? Uh, some of us haven't asked that question in a long time, and some of us have asked that question. We feel like we haven't heard an answer. So I thought this morning, um, I wanted to give us some time to consider that. Um, I lied to the band earlier and said I was, I was gonna talk about some other stuff. I'm not going to, Raph, by the way. We're just gonna pray, and then we're gonna, um, I'm gonna try to wrap up quickly. So I wanna invite you just to do a posture of, of prayer so that you can consider this question with me. And maybe it means opening your hands on your lap. Maybe it means taking the hand of someone you love beside you. Sort of unifying time of prayer. And I want to invite you just to take yourself to this, this wedding banquet. You're, you're a servant. You've been watching from the side. You realize that there's this guy, Jesus, here because he showed up with his disciples. And they are kind of telling you stories about how he found one of us under that tree over there. And others may be fine by the riverside, the seaside. And People have decided to follow this guy, and so maybe you're like a servant, just a little suspicious about this Jesus. Um, but Jesus' mom told you, do whatever Jesus said. Do whatever Jesus tells you. And your focus moves away from Mary, and, and your attention is now on Jesus in the room. And now Jesus is saying to you, I have something I need you to do. 
I'm trying to do something in this place. And I'm going to need your help. We start to wonder, what, what could he do with me? Why would he be looking at me? But what the, what the heck? Okay, what do you want from me, Jesus? Jesus says there's, there's some, some water over there in the jar. Jars are a little empty. I need you to refill those things to the brim. And maybe you hear in your heart that there's some half-empty part of you. There's something that's not quite full in you that needs to be filled so that it can be used. Uh, maybe you're weary right now. And if you just had more energy, you could fulfill what Jesus is asking of you. Maybe there's a, a resource. Maybe you're, you're feeling like if I just had more money, I would, I would help. If I just had a little more left over at the end of the month after I spent it on my bills and my credit card debt that I used to pay for all those things I thought I needed when I bought them. If I just had more money, I could... Jesus, I could give it to you and you could do something with it. And so maybe not in like a name and claim it spirit, but maybe you need to just take another look at your resources. Maybe when you look at them, you would see you actually have full jars all the way to the brim. Maybe Jesus is saying, you have all you need if you would share it. Maybe you're just too busy. Just too busy, feeling like you don't have enough time. If you just had more time, then you could do the thing Jesus wants you to do. If you just had more time, if you weren't busy working and chasing kids and going on vacations and if you just had more time, maybe Jesus could then use you. See, I think all of us want the choice wine. And some of us feel like a bunch of dirty water. And I have this sense this morning that there's some folks here who showed up filling a bunch of like dirty water and have somehow been convinced by the voices in their heads, the voices of the evil one or the watching public around them that they'll always be just a jar of dirty water. But I sense this morning Jesus wanting to turn you into wine. wanting to take what seems so useless and to make it something that opens eyes, that brings delight to the ones who receive it. All of us showed up kind of like servants maybe feeling like servants. But later in the gospel, we're gonna, we're gonna hear Jesus saying something like in the 15th chapter, something like, if you do what I tell you to do, you are my friends. He goes on and says something to the effect of, servants don't know their master's business, but I've, told you, shown you everything, everything that the Father wants, and so I call you friend. No longer servant, now I call you friend. God, thank you for gathering 
uh, your friends here in the room. Help us, God, to hear from you what it is you have invited us to do. Help us to have confidence that if our jars are half empty or if we feel like our jars are full of something that would not be useful in your kingdom or in your hands, that, that this story, this moment where you took something that had once been used to wash and turn it into something that would eventually set us free, water to wine to blood, Jesus, we, uh, with everything we can, we put our lives in your hands and we trust you with it. Do with us now immeasurably more than we could ever hope, think, or imagine. And do it in Jesus' name. Amen.